I'd like to introduce Patrick Hall. He's a principal scientist at bnh.ai, an advisor to h2o.ai, and an adjunct professor in the Department of Decision Sciences at the George Washington University. Please, everybody welcome in and uh, we look. Oh, yeah. Whoa, whoa. It's incredible. We got a really a good group out here. Thanks a lot. Enjoy the talk. Thank you so much for the for the kind introduction. So um, I'm I'm going to go ahead and get started. I see that it's 925. I know that I'm not in presentation mode and I will switch to presentation mode very shortly. Um, one thing that that I have to say right off the bat is I am not a lawyer and what you're about to hear is not legal advice. OK, if you want legal advice on these subjects, Please hire my company and an attorney, you know, an attorney will reach out to you. But um, just have to make that very clear since I do represent a law firm that, that this is not legal advice and I am not an attorney. Uh, that said, we're going to give it, get a talk, get into a talk about legal and um, technical issues that can come up in machine learning and, and what you can do to prevent them. And um, you know, this is a short talk. I, I can certainly hang out a little bit afterwards if people want to keep discussing. Uh, and I know it may leave some of you sort of craving more technical details. So I just wanted to point out before we, before we get started, um, there's a slide at the end that has these resources. If you contact me on LinkedIn or Twitter, I'm, I'm happy to send you the slides. Um, and and some of those resources I was mentioning that really do go into the technical details. And again, you may need to double click on, on the presentation screen so you can see this. Um, this is a very long medium post that, that has most of the technical meat of the presentation. Um, there have been academic workshops on this subject of model debugging. Uh, companies like Google have put out resources for model debugging and um, my company just today, just in this talk, is announcing the release of a of a AI incident response checklist to help you step by step prevent and deal with these problems if they do happen. So um, again, we'll there'll be a slide with these technical resources at the end. I just wanted to make you aware because this is a relatively short com uh, uh, talk that that there is more technical meat here uh, if you'd like to dig into it. All right, all that with all that out of the way, let's get into the presentation. So yes, I'm not a lawyer, but I did co-found a law firm, which is uh, allowed in Washington, DC. And um, BNH.AI is the first law firm uh, co-run by, by technical and legal staff. And our thesis is that, that it takes technical and legal, if not more expertise, to, to deal with the, the, the complex liabilities that AI creates. Now, another sort of personal thesis of mine is that many data scientists are operating sort of in happy oblivion of uh, the sort of real world consequences that can occur because of machine learning models. And we'll discuss some of these things in the course of the talk. Um, so this short talk will focus on what is model debugging, uh, why you should care about it, how to get started, um, AI incidents. You know, this is this is when your machine learning model goes bad, and and um, this does happen. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And essentially, we do model debugging to prevent AI incidents. And then there's a slide for those resources that that I was showing. Okay, so so what is model debugging? Um, let's concentrate on the text on the left at first. So. So model debugging is a, is a new or newish subdiscipline of machine learning, and it's focused on uh, finding and fixing problems in, in complex machine learning pipelines. OK, so it, it's highly related to these other newer disciplines of post hoc explanation or, or explainable AI and discrimination testing and remediation. These these things go hand in hand. I'm not. I'm not sure that it's helpful to sort of break them out into three separate buckets, 
Um, I'm going to focus on model debugging today, though, as sort of the QA of machine learning and being a little bit separate from explaining a machine learning model and a little bit separate from testing a machine learning model from discrimination. Um, again, all these things go hand in hand. I'm, the focus on this talk will be on, on sort of the QA part of machine learning. Now, you should be applying standard QA best practices to your machine learning pipelines, just standard software testing best practices. I'm not an expert on that. Um, probably people in the audience know much more about that than I do. The, the issue here is that machine learning is insanely complex, um, complex on, on a nearly exponential level from, from standard application software. Um, millions of rules, billions of parameters, uh, so, so it's complex, it's wrapped typically in an already complex sort of application software. Uh, it has this nasty tendency to drift over time. So even if you keep your code perfectly maintained, uh, the data that's coming into your model, uh, will drift and that will cause your results to drift and degrade over time. And in machine learning. Uh, failures or, or wrong decisions are a feature and not a bug. So typically if, if your standard software is doing something wrong, that's a bug and you fix it. Well, in machine learning, we just have to allow for some wrong decisions and, and we hope that they're wrong less often than humans. And that would be a good thing to check actually before you get too involved in machine learning. Um, you know, I've, I've pointed out here that, that I feel that um, model debugging promotes trust directly um, and it promotes understanding as a side effect. And I think that's one reason why it's, it's different from explanation where explanation uh, promotes understanding directly and trust as a side effect. I don't want to get too sidetracked by this sort of philosophical discussion, but I do think it's, it's important. Um, I can trust models that I don't understand and I can understand models that I don't trust. So an example of trusting a model without uh, understanding it, this happens all the time, actually, when people use black box machine learning. Um, and, and, you know, an actual good example of this is in fraud detection, where people have been using sophisticated black box neural networks, maybe for decades. Um, they don't really understand how they work, but they know that they catch more fraud than people do. And so that's an example of, of trusting a model without understanding it. And I think really model debugging enhances that kind of trust. Whereas something like post hoc explanation helps us understand a model, that understanding may lead us to not trust the model, right? People always say, well, explanation helps us trust the model. It only helps you trust the model if you like the explanations that, that you get out of the model. If you don't like the explanations, you might not trust it. So. Um, that sort of trust understanding dichotomy is helpful for me when I start thinking about the differences between these uh, techniques. I would also say that model debugging is only one of many steps you need to take to, to, to de-risk machine learning models. Um, this diagram is adapted from a, a recent publication called A Responsible Machine Learning Workflow. And if you're interested in learning more about that, please um, reach out to me on, on social media or through the, through the conference app. Um, so, you know, model debugging, it's like QA for machine learning. Um, machine learning is complex, tends to drift over time and allows for failure. So we need some specialized techniques to test it. Um, but just keep in mind, this is only one step of many that you need to do to uh, to really decrease risk in your machine learning pipelines. So, you know, why should you care about model debugging, right? I'm I'm not a big um, ethics, you know, I'm I'm not an ethicist. This isn't a tech ethics talk. Um, you know, I I really try to 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 get through to people on on just a nuts and bolts level. So, um, you know, and and I do think. AI principles and AI ethics are extremely important. I'm just not qualified to talk on those subjects, okay? I'm only qualified to talk on, on the technical aspect. So from, a, from just sort of a technical nuts and bolts perspective, uh, you know, mach machine learning models can discriminate, they can, uh, they can leak private data, and they can be hacked, and, and, uh, and they can make silly mistakes. So I'll have many more examples of this later on in the presentations, but but things I can bring up now are sort of the gen, the gender shades line of research where commercial facial recognition uh, 
APIs were shown to have about 30% less accuracy for women of color than white males. And they were used, they were sold to law enforcement. Um, there's the Apple Goldman Sachs debacle where uh, men were supposedly getting much, much, much larger uh, credit limits than, than women that they were married to. Uh, you know, and, and some of these things, investigations are still ongoing. I'm not, I'm not saying anyone's guilty, but, but they generated a lot of bad press for the companies involved. If nothing else, they caused reputational harm, which does cost money. Uh, machine learning can also just make silly mistakes. There's a very famous one in a, um, uh, a medical risk model where the machine learning model with in all its fantastic deep learning brilliance, you know, I'm not, it probably wasn't a deep learning model, but, uh, you know, it said that people with asthma have a lower pneumonia risk, right? And and that's just because machine learning models just look at pure correlation. People with asthma were getting more medical attention. They didn't have lower pneumonia risk. They were just getting more medical attention. So machine learning models can make really silly mistakes. And I'll have an example of another one later in, in the slide deck. And then, um, you know, why? Yes, data science is, data science is the sexiest job of the 21st century or, or whatever people used to think. Um, but, but this, all this hype has led to some kind of strange ignorance of, of, of the fact that machine learning is just software uh, that's not immune from bugs and security vulnerabilities. And in fact, due to the complexity and the drift characteristics, it's probably actually, um, more susceptible to failures and attacks than than standard application software. So um, this this is an important topic. I I claim anyway. All right. So so how do I do this? All right. If you agree with me that this is important and this is something you'd like to do, um, I, I'd say there's four main practical approaches. Okay. I, I think the, and and of course there's academic literature that that you should read. Um, that, that may present more sort of sophisticated approaches, but I think for, for people working in the trenches, these, these four ways are a good way to get started. So I would say sensitivity analysis, residual analysis, um, benchmark models, and security audits are, are four practical ways to get started with model debugging. Um, so sensitivity analysis is a really, really simple idea. We just simulate data that seems interesting and uh, see how the model performs on it. And what's important here is that we do machine learning because we want nonlinear functional forms. And we want, um, which means, you know, a tiny change in an input variable can lead to a large change in the output of the model. We do machine learning because we want, you know, to consider high degree interaction. So that means that a tiny change in two or three different variables could lead to di very different outcomes. So, you know, that's what we think makes machine learning more accurate. And the, the issue there is that, that that means if I haven't tested my model on, on data that, that I've never seen before, say data like during a, in, during a recession or data like during a pandemic, I will really have no idea how my model will react. It is not guaranteed to extrapolate linearly. Linear models extrapolate linearly. Machine learning models can literally do almost anything on data they've never seen before. And if you haven't tested that explicitly, you just don't know what your model will do. Uh, so, so what I have on the slide is, is an example of a, an adversarial example search that I did. And the, the code for this is on GitHub and, and you're welcome to check it out. It's, it's in the references at the end. Um, in fact, the, the code for all the technical examples I'm gonna show is on GitHub and, and I'm happy to share that with you. Um, so, so here I, I took one row of data and I perturbed it, I don't know, maybe 12,000 times. And I essentially sliced it and diced it by a few of the important variables in the model and, and looked at the different response surfaces that came out. Um, and in this example, you know, I can see things like this is a monotonically constrained model. So that, that helps with interpretability and stability. And I'm a big fan of monotonicity constraints. It's a monotonically constrained XGBoost model. And I can see that, you know, across all these different um, perspectives, the model is monotonic. So that's a good thing at least from my perspective. Um, but I can see one of those silly mistakes uh, here where um, no matter how much my most recent 
payment amount is, even up to a million dollars, uh, I'm still getting a 0.4 probability of default if I've um, if I've missed more than two payments. Okay, so so again, I'd, I'd argue that that's potentially a silly mistake. If someone has missed two payments and and wants to pay a million dollars, I'm not sure you want to issue a high probability of default. This this may make your model unable to handle prepayment. Also, what if I want to go on vacation and not worry about my credit card and I make a massive payment and then plan on missing two payments because I'm I'm just rich. I don't care. I'm not saying I'm rich. I'm just saying that's a scenario that could happen. This this model wouldn't be able to handle that. Okay. Uh, and I wouldn't have understood that had I not done this this simulation. And again, you know, this is kind of interesting. This this uh, bottom right point is kind of interesting. You know, pay amount one and pay amount two are not super important variables in the model, but there's this weird little peak in their in their response surface, and. And that is very interesting to know about from a security perspective. I would say that this, you know, I did this whole search looking for adversarial examples, looking for examples, rows of data that can make my models do weird things. And this was the biggest surprise to me. I, I could see that there's, there's some values of pay one and pay two, which makes sense logically, you know, the most recent payments um, that will send my model into extremely high probability of default state. Uh, I would not have known that from just looking at the feature importance though. So, so we're essentially talking about simulations um, that, that uh, make my model, you know, that, that show me how my model work in different scenarios. And, um, you know, I can do that in terms of common techniques like partial dependence. I can do an adversarial example search, and that, that's what I was doing here. Or I can do something known as a random attack, where I just expose my, my model to a lot of uh, random data. And uh, that, that's probably the number one place to get started. If, if you just want to get started with, with um, model debugging, just expose your model to a ton of random data and see what happens, see what kind of errors happen, right? Expose your entire pipeline to random data, double byte character sets, um, you know, data sets with a million columns in one row, things like this. See what kind of um, see what kind of uh, errors your API is coughing up to people. Does it have you know what kind of information is in in the stack trace that you're coughing up to people? Uh, how is your model behaving in these weird situations? So. So random attack means giving the model a ton of random data and seeing how it behaves. And I think that's the simplest and easiest way to get started. Okay. So the next sort of practical approach here is, is residual analysis, right? And this is looking at the difference between what the model predicted and, uh, and what actually happened. And, you know, I can do that sort of overall, or I can break it down variable by variable. And that's what I've done here. And so what I can see is these are good values for people's most recent repayment status. And these down here are bad values for people's most recent repayment status. And what I can tell by looking at these residuals is there's just a massive difference between these, these pictures, right? I have, I have large um, re residuals on sort of the left side here for these good values and large residuals on the right side here for these bad values. And what that tells me is uh, the model is just simply unable to handle the scenario where someone has good most recent repayment uh, statuses, but then goes on to default. And it also can't handle the opposite where, um, where someone has, where someone has not had a good payment history and then they do make their next payment. So if my model can't handle these scenarios, what's the point of releasing, you know, 600,000 rules in a GBM out onto the world when I could just have one simple rule, you know, is, is their most recent payment, you know, greater than one month late? If so, then, then they're probably going to default. If not, then they're not going to default. That's what my model is doing. That's what, you know, the hundreds of thousands of rules in my GBM, that's what they came up with. And I'm able to tell that here by looking at the residuals. Uh, there's, and there's a lot of other, you know, different ways to look at residuals. Um, 
you can look at the residuals versus the Shapley values, residuals versus the local feature importance. You can even get local feature importance for residuals. So instead of what features are driving my model's predictions, I can see what features are driving my model's errors. I think that's super interesting. Um, I can do I can do disparate accuracy and disparate error rates, right? How accurate is my model for white men versus how accurate is my model for women of color? Uh, and, and that gets into some basic discrimination testing. And then um, explaining residuals, I think is really useful. So, um, you know, how can I build a model of my residuals and, and explain how my residuals work? Can I get an understanding of when my model is wrong? And I think th these are all sort of very powerful techniques to help you debug. Once I figure out what's wrong, then I might be a, have a way to fix it. Okay, uh, very quickly, benchmark models are, um, the idea of comparing a simple model to a complex model at, at sort of, you can do this during training to get some insights. And that's what the picture on the slide is. Um, there's some group of observations in my training set where the machine learning model is dead wrong and a linear model is dead right. And I just like to investigate that and, and see if I can figure out what's going on. What I'm suggesting with the quote at the top of the slide is, is, a, is a little bit different. I'm suggesting that at at scoring time in real time, when you're issuing predictions, compare your complex model predictions to a simple model prediction. And if they're too different, maybe hold off on, you know, issuing that complex model prediction because something could have gone wrong with it. If you're doing deep learning, you know, it, it is likely that a deep learning model would issue a, a significantly different um, prediction than, than a linear model. But in the sort of old fashioned data mining world that I work in, a machine learning model is going to buy you, you know, say two to 5% extra accuracy. It, it shouldn't be that different from a logistic regression prediction. And if it is, you might want to investigate that. Okay. Um, you should do security audits on your own machine learning. If, if you're going to deploy them in a public facing way, uh, there are about, I, I'm going to say 15 known machine learning specific attacks. And, um, I do think they're fairly rare and exotic these days, but I do expect that to change as machine learning becomes more and more uh, in, important in our in our society. Um, and and you can even go so far as to red team or or do bug bounties on your machine learning. And and you could do it for say discrimination bugs, like I was talking about in some of the previous slides, or you could do it for these these attacks. And um, the machine learning attacks are are nasty because they, they can mix up privacy and security issues and discrimination issues. And, and I, I don't have time in this short talk to go into all the attacks. In the resources, you can find sort of a listing and a description of them. You, could, you should be trying to think about attacking your own model and attacking your own uh, machine learning APIs or, or red teaming them, essentially having other people do that for you. Um, okay, so th those are the four main ways that I think you can do model debugging, uh, sensitivity analysis, residual analysis, benchmark models, and, and security audits of machine learning models. So if I find a problem, how do I fix it? There's a lot of interesting ways these days. So, so here, there's a list on the screen, and, and I'll try to comment on, on some of them briefly. One, one of the main problems in machine learning is, is we're training models on data exhaust. We're training model on models on data that, that was never meant to be modeled. It's just the exhaust of some other operational process. So there is a whole science called design of experiment where we actually collect data for the specific reason of asking and answering questions. Uh, you know, data science as a discipline might want to think about that more. But, but one of the, the, the major problems is we just don't have enough data or we don't have the right data. That, that's often a fundamental problem. And what you have to do there is just go get more data and get the right data. And, and that's the problem with that credit lending model that I showed. We just don't have enough data. It's too dependent on people's most recent repayment status. We need more data in that model so it can make a more educated decision. Um, I'm a big proponent of interpretable models and explainable by AI. You cannot debug what you don't understand. You cannot mitigate risk that you don't understand. Um, and, and these machine learning models present serious risk. 
Um, certain models are editable. An example of that would be GA2M or EBM from Microsoft Research. This model is designed to be editable and interpretable. If you find a problem in it, it offers ways to fix it. Um, that's probably one of the most easy models to edit, but, but any model that sort of generates an editable artifact, say source code, it, it's possible to edit and fix problems that you find. Model assertions are the idea that I can um, that that I can do rules on my predictions, and so here's you know a torn from the a torn from the headlines example would be if if someone is deceased, don't send them drug coupons. Okay, so so I have a I have a marketing model that's saying this person's really sick, uh, they might be interested in in drug discounts. Well, I should have a model assertion that says, check the database and make sure they're alive so you don't send their family a drug coupon, you know, for their recently deceased relative. That's an example of a, of a model assertion. For people who have been doing predictive modeling for a long time, we just call those business rules. Um, you know, discrimination testing and remediation is a, is a massive topic. I don't have time to get into it now. I, I will say that that if you just think about discrimination when you're training your model, you can get a long way. Um, for instance, I just did an experiment for a class I'm teaching. I trained 200 neural networks and measured a discrimination metric known as AIR, adverse impact ratio. There were about five models that, that were as accurate as, as the most accurate model, but had much different discrimination characteristics. And that's just due to the characteristics of a, a, of a random grid search. So if you just think about discrimination while you're training your models, while you're selecting features, while you're tuning hyperparameters, that can get you a long way. Um, there are lots of sophisticated ways to, to remediate discrimination from machine learning models, and I'm happy to talk to that later. Uh, if you deploy a machine learning model, you should be, mo you should be monitoring it um, because we don't, we don't know how it's going to behave on data we haven't seen before. And uh, if, if you detect problems, you should, you should try to take action. And then of course, anomaly detection, anomaly detection on your inputs, anomaly detections on your outputs. And, and you wanna be alerted when you encounter an anomaly. All right, so the real reason we would do all these things that, that I just talked about is because we don't want to cause AI incidents. I could have kept going there's 1,200 reports of AI incidents, you know, public AI incidents uh, thus far. And the, these range from discrimination to privacy problems to, to the occasional machine learning security problem. Uh, the partnership on AI keeps a database, and, and that's where I get that number of, of 1,200 plus public reports of AI incidents. Um, I'm happy to send you the links if, if you want to see where these, these come from. I'm not trying to be alarmist. Um, this is very real. I don't hear people in machine learning and AI talking about this, but this is very, very real. Your AI can go seriously wrong in the real world. It can cost money. It can break laws. It can hurt people. Um, my firm describes an AI incident as, as any behavior by the model with the potential to cause harm, expect it or not. Um, we're happy to take feedback. You may, you may have an, another definition. Um, you know, uh, an AI incident would also be character. We would claim that an AI incident is characterized by uh, by materiality and and by how prepared you are. Where materiality is the probability of occurrence is roughly the probability of the occurrence multiplied by the the cost of the occurrence. And um, preparedness, right? If if you just deploy a machine learning model with no documentation no monitoring, um, it could be out doing, you know, it, it could be out messing up and you would have no idea. And all of that could be accumulating cost. And, and when it does finally explode, uh, you're gonna have a huge problem. If instead you were more prepared for, for your AI to fail, uh, you could get the situation under control much easier. So, so this is what we think an AI incident is. And we think that it can, you know, you need to think about them in terms of how prepared you are for it and what the materiality of the incident is. So on the left is a quote from Google research. And on the right is a, is a theorem or, or two lemmas known as the Borel-Cantelli lemmas. And these are studied in sort of broader, 
uh, broader sort of incident response or, or, or safety field, say, say the way we study nuclear reactors or commercial aviation for, for safety. And basically what these things say is it's not if an incident is going to occur, it's when, and that's a mathematical reality. So think about something like a commercial airplane or a nuclear reactor. We know how highly regulated we are. these are. We know the, the steps that people take to keep these technologies safe, but they still have incidents, okay? So what I see in the AI world is we're not doing any of that. We don't have, we have very little regulation. People are thinking about the safety. So there are going to be many more incidents, okay? And, you know, we do want to enable people to innovate, right? And, and so we're, we're trying to, to port over uh, best practices from the, the software and cybersecurity world. And that's why today, you know, at this talk right now, uh, we're announcing the sample AI instant response checklist. Okay, so so I highly encourage you to, I strongly encourage you to check this out. If you're deploying machine learning, um, you need to be prepared for things to go wrong. And that's not because you're bad at your job. That's not, you know, that's, that's not an ethical statement. It's just a technology statement. Machine learning is a piece of technology, just like an airplane or a nuclear reactor that can fail and that failure has consequences, okay? And you need, if you're responsible and you don't wanna cost your company a ton of money, you should be prepared for that. I, after going through this exercise of making the AI incident response checklist, I personally can't believe that I've deployed machine learning without thinking about, you know, an, an incident and how to respond to it. Um, you know, basic things you can do, and I'm going to stop talking because we're, we're very close to the end. Um, basic things you can do. Yes, please check out our AI incident response plan, but keep an up-to-date inventory of all your AI systems. Monitor your systems for anomalous behavior. Stand up AI specific um, security measures like doing um, bug bounties or red teaming of your AI. Um, and, and just keep documentation, right? You need to document machine learning the same way you document any enterprise software asset. Because, and one of the main reasons is if it goes wrong, how will you know it's gone wrong and how will you know what to do? Um, how can you turn it off? How much will that cost? What processes are dependent on the model? Who worked on the model? If, if you're in the midst of an incident and you don't have the, the um, answers to those questions, it's just going to be worse. All right. So here's the resources. I'll leave these up while we, uh, while we do some questions if I haven't run everyone off. So Patrick, you have a great audience. There's a large number of people. I haven't run anyone off. We've got a couple questions. Okay. Uh, we got a number of questions from this aid guy, so I'm going to let him. Um, All right, we're going to give the other people. <laughs> okay. Can. So, so we had a general comment, which was, uh, "Can you please write a book on this?" So, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it. Actually, I'm in talks with O'Reilly now, but I'm, I'm busy and I have a baby, and I don't, you know, I, I'm want, I want to. Yes. Okay. The other question was, how does someone sign up for your class? Oh well. Here, I will, so, so I, I make everything as public as possible, but I mean, it's a real university class, so you would just have to be enrolled in, in George Washington University, but here, I'm gonna put the link to all the resources in the chat right now. Thank you. So, responsible, responsible ML class. So this is kind of a general uh, question related to the materials around this talk, but people have been asking about the slides, the Medium art article, the GitHub, your GitHub, and the AI incident response checklist. So I'm assuming that's on the website for the AI incident response checklist. The Medium article, actually, someone posted a link to that, so that's probably taken care of. So if you look in the chat window, you'll see that. But in terms of the slides and GitHub, I think that's the only remaining thing out of the- Okay. All right. So I- too, or, oh, sorry. Just contact me on LinkedIn or Twitter. I will I will give you the slides. If, if there's some official mechanism through the conference, um, I will, I will, you know, 
follow that, right? So, so, but if you want them before, if if you want them before that, then just contact me on social media. I'm I'm happy to send them to you. I will put the the link for the um, sample AI incident response is is the top link there. I will put it um, in the chat right now. So uh, here's the and I'll put GitHub in the chat also. Okay, please. all right. So yeah. here's the and and are people am I putting this in the right place? Uh, yes, I see the responsible ML class. Okay. okay, so there's the AI incident response checklist. Awesome. And here's GitHub examples. GitHub examples. Okay. Oh, All right, and I'll put my LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Yes. yes. All right. GitHub examples. G -g 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 -g. Give me one second here. And by the way, for people out there who don't know, the aid guy is me, so I'm not <laughs> mean or anything being it's a joke. Um, okay. All right, so, and then really quick link, I'll, I'll do my LinkedIn real quick too. Awesome. Um, oh, David already took care of it for you. Oh, awesome. All right, thank you, David. So there's another question, which is, can you give an example of an ML attack? Yes, all right. So, so let's go back to that slide. I ended up kind of, of course, you know, I only had 12 slides because I knew this was a short talk and then I ran my mouth so much for all of them. Uh, are you still able to see my screen? Yes. All right. So this is an example of an AI attack. All right. And, and what I've done here, it, this is what's known as a, this is what's known as a model extraction attack. So Which Patrick, is it's kind of I, hard to read the text here. If you can kind of annotate for people so that I will. Uh, I will. Thank you. All right. So and and again, this this there's a link to the software example here. This is on my class GitHub. So so a model extraction attack is when I submit data to your prediction API, your public facing prediction API, and you give me predictions back. Right. So as an attacker, and this is why the machine learning attacks are so difficult. As an attacker, all I've done is use your API for what it was designed for, okay? So I, I essentially, you know, craft some data. It could be as simple as random uniform data. That doesn't work that well, but it could be that simple. So, so I essentially craft some simulated data and I upload it into your prediction API. I get your predictions back. I join the two. I have my random data here. I have the predictions I got back from you. I join them. All right, I create a, a single data set and then I build a new model in between my my data that I submitted and your predictions. This is the new X. This is the new Y. All right. And that what I what I get when I do that is a copy of your model. And and I can attest um, this this um, this stolen model. I didn't do anything fancy. I either um, simulated data from normal distributions or exponential distributions for the inputs. And then I just submitted them to this to, to my own black box model. I trained the model, like I said, and I know for a fact, you know, that this top split should be pay zero less than 1.5. And if you zoom in here, it says pay zero less than 1.50285, right? So it got the top split exactly right. I now know your proprietary business logic. OK, I now know how you are decide your main decision point for for issuing credit cards. If I'm your competitor, I can do something slightly easier for my customers and I can advertise about that. Um, now, I'm not saying do this. That could that could be illegal. Another issue here is is the questionable legality of these things. Right. In some cases, this might just be ingenuity. In some cases, it might be illegal um, more. OK, so so the left side of this tree is almost a perfect copy of of the actual model. And the right side of this tree gets all the logic right. It just does it in a different order. So, so this is an example of an AI attack where I steal your model, right? I, so all the, all the time and energy you put into training your super fancy model, I just got it, okay? Oh, I, and I see this, you know, sort of follow-up questions are regression type models more robust to these attacks? Um, no. I don't think these are very difficult attack. There, there is a whole subdiscipline of adversarial machine learning and robust machine learning. And I would, I would say, start Googling that, start Googling that. 
The next question is basically what is the technique that you use to perturb the record when you found you, know, you made 12,000 yes. of these records? Very good question. So this slide, okay. I'm going to get out of this and I'm going to go. Um, this is why you should look at the medium post. Um, and I know I need to zoom in massively here. I'm, I'm only showing this because the exact answer to the question is here. Oh, okay. Then. So literally laid out step by step. I will read that. Let's move on to the next question. No, no, no. well, let me, let me show, oh. let me show people at least where it is. All right. So, so it's here. Um, so I used a technique known as individual conditional expectation oh, to yeah. find a row of data that, that has a big swing in its predictions. Okay, so, so I found a row of data that has a big swing in its predictions and I based my adversarial search off that. And um, these, are the, these are the exact steps. Okay, thank here. you. I will definitely read that. Okay. There's another question in the chat window. What did you do to prevent security attacks are there any tools or security settings that you can specify in the machine learning model during training or at inference time to yes okay so so again i would say you know google robust ml google adversarial um machine learning uh hold on let me let me get my you know <laughs> There's a whole there's a whole book on it, okay? Um, so, but but yes, there's a lot you can do. Um, I I think I think uh, in the machine learning model itself, the key is essentially to think about regularization and and other and and then how to protect the the training data and and that would be PETs, privacy enhancing technologies like. Um, like federated learning and like differential privacy, all of these things can be incorporated into the machine learning training. Uh, but if we look at another one of these resources from the slides real quick, um, let's see, actually, let me, there, there's a lot. Okay. So, so a main thing that you can do, um, a main thing that you can do in, in terms of deploying your models to protect them is just require authentication for your API. Okay. Don't let people use your API anonymously and throttle your predictions. Like we're all obsessed with like, oh, my API can do, you know, a prediction every 300 milliseconds, whatever it is. Um, that from a security and privacy standpoint, that may not be a good thing. You may actually want to slow down how fast data leaks out of your API. So I think, you know, throttling your API, like after someone gets 10 predictions, you can slow them down and making people authenticate to your prediction API are two of the, two of the biggest things you can do to, pre to prevent the attacks. Um, this link has a lot of my ideas and, and my ideas tend to be more sort of like practical, say for, for banks, um, you know, and, and not machine learning research ideas. You should definitely look at the machine learning research ideas, but so like this link has a lot of practical security tips. The only other question I think is kind of to the example you made relating to payments. And you said that, mm -hmm. When you did your adversarial analysis, you found that the model, if two payments were missed, made predictions that the person was going to a default. And mm -hmm. isn't that significant if someone, I mean, isn't that a legitimate red flag? Yes. It's not discriminatory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, no, no, no. That's a legitimate red flag. What it, so, so I'm making two, two points here, and it, it is kind of a subtle point. Thank you for, for bringing that back up. What I'm saying is all you need in this case is a single rule. If pay zero, if, if they're more than one month late on their most recent pay, repayment, that will give you the same accuracy as a GBM with 60,000 rules, okay? So, so that the, the problem is that you're pushing all this unneeded complexity out into the world, which increases the attack surface, increases the probability for failure, increases the potential for discrimination or other security problems when you know, so so it's not that the it's not that that decision cut point is wrong. It's just that 
I don't need a gradient boosting machine to tell me that. Okay, but that sounds almost like you're trying to advocate for not using machine learning. I would say situations. I would say you shouldn't use machine learning that can be play, replaced by a single rule. I, okay. I would say that. I mean, okay, that's... I do. I love it. Look, I'm making my career out of machine learning, just like everybody else here. Like I'm, you know, I, I I'm not against machine learning. I'm a, I'm I'm sort of for the responsible use of machine learning. And one responsible question, you know, a set of responsible questions to ask would be, you know, is this more accurate than a person making the decision? Um, is it more accurate than a single rule or a linear model, right? That, that should be a basic test, right? Is your machine learning more accurate than a linear model? Um, and, and so, yeah, I don't want to come across as being against machine learning. Uh, I want to, I, I love machine learning. Right? I, I just want people to, to, I want people to not think of it as being magically immune to failures and attacks. Okay, but in your example, replacing mm -hmm. a whole GBM gradient boosted mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, machine with machine. A, a, a single rule mm -hmm. would not take into consideration all the other features that were fed into the model, which are going to also be able to make decisions on those other features. Like if you have one rule, I agree. You know, I, it's, and and, it's have and this is value. why this is why this is why you should debug models. I didn't know that this model was so focused on pay zero until I went through all this. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. I thought it was doing all these things that you're saying, like taking into account all this nonlinearity and interactions between other variables, but it's not. It's just focused in on this one variable. And I didn't know that until I debugged it. I see. Thank you for that clarification. No, no. And, and I had to move quickly through those slides. So, so I appreciate you sort of helping suss this out. And I see somebody in the I see somebody in the chat saying they've had cases where ten thousand plus features are as powerful as two features, and and that rings true with my experience also. Now, and that doesn't. Sometimes you'll need the ten thousand features, right? Sometimes you'll need the two features. It's just this idea of dumping a bunch of features into a black box machine learning model and see how they do on the Kaggle leaderboard doesn't port well to high stakes applications in the real world. So this is where using your techniques, we could actually tease out and make the other features more relevant, uh, produce better results, yes. and all these other things. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so and, and, you know, since we're talking about it, and I've tortured this silly data set to death, the, the real issue here is there's no, so we have their payment and billing information over six months, but like we don't have their debt to income ratio over six months. So really, if if we had more information, then the mo we, we need more information to spread the focus of the model out on. We really only have one useful signal in this data set. But like I, I imagine if we had their debt to income ratio over six months and you could see their debt to income spiking, you know, that that might be an indication that that they're going to default. Right. And we could spread that signal out across more than one variable. So we have. And, another OK, so. Yeah. Sorry. I, the question. No, no, no. I'm sorry. So, yes. Do I think synthetic data can help? Yes. In, in certain cases, yes. I do think synthetic data can help. Okay. Well, and, I. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Did you want to elaborate that? Well, I see that that um, uh, you know, someone is saying need to be sure that the features are truly signal and not noise. Um, maybe all those additional features really didn't contribute thing other, anything other than risk. And that's the exact point that I'm making. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Right. It's just sometimes the other sometimes doing all this complexity is necessary. Um, sometimes these things are much more accurate and fast and objective than people. Sometimes they're not. And I just see, you know, all the hype is focused on that success scenario. But if we're all sitting here making careers out of machine learning, like, shouldn't we take it as seriously as we take airplanes and nuclear reactors and just, you know, be real about the the fact that they're going to fail and those failures failures can have serious consequences. Well, Patrick, I don't see any other new questions. Okay. And I'll shut up. <laughs> well, this was a great talk and I want to thank you and everyone here for joining the talk. Whoa. Yes. Oh my gosh. They love you, Patrick. Um, thank you so much. Great talk, everybody. Saying that. Thank you, Abe. I'm, 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 uh, I'm glad we got to chat a little bit too. Yeah, same here. It was good seeing you again, Patrick. Yep. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Thank you.
and and please connect on LinkedIn or Twitter. I'll be happy to share the slides. Bye. Bye-bye.